Before we start to today's last chat, I'm speaking with Laura Quinn, who is in Farnham in Surrey in the UK. I'm delighted to hear that you're in Farnham because I know you were in Plymouth and um, you've just got a, a brand new job. And I was wondering whether it was actually going to go ahead or not, because, um, you know, with this COVID, today is the 23rd of April, by the way, 2020, um, and we're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I actually didn't realize whether, I didn't know whether they, you, would, you would actually be able to take it up or not. So, um, yeah, so how's it going and where are you? Yeah, yeah, so I am actually currently in Farnham, even though I'm working from home. It's probably been the most unusual time to start a new job, especially because the, the job title is class technical tutor. So I very much um, the technical support for the students. However, I'm not actually in the workshops because obviously access to the, to the college facilities is completely closed. So uh, my, my role now has um, very much changed in its nature. But I've started and um, I've started doing online classes for my students instead. So it's all working out well so far. I'm definitely relying on things like these video chats. Amazing. And you're in the um, College for Creative Arts there, isn't that right? Yeah, that's the one, the University for the Creative Arts. So that's UCA. And how many students are you dealing with? So in the glass department, I think in, in total, there's around 17 or 18. Um, we do have some other students, though, that come in from other areas. Um, you know, I think, I think with glass especially, a lot of people, their heads get turned and want to come in and make work. So I think the potential is there to definitely work with more students. And such a challenging time for you to take over. I mean, not even being able to meet your students physically. Um, you haven't actually met them at all, have you? No, well, I only got to actually meet about um, three or four of them who were involved in my interview process. Wow. So it was trial by fire. <laughs> um, and and uh, luckily they accepted me. But um, so I met those few and then the rest, yeah, have just been on, on the screen. Um, so it's as good as it gets for the moment. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to actually being physically in the workshops with them. So what, what can you actually do um what can you do with them in a technical sense from, you know, through, through video content? I mean, obviously they won't have access to the material or, you know, they're, they're, mm. they're, I presume you have finally your students who are getting ready for their shows and they've been glass blowing or, or have they, or what, you know, using all the kilns, et cetera. So how's that going? Well, um, UCA actually is incredibly well kitted out in its glass department. It's got a really, really big, cold working section, really good uh, plaster and casting section and a really well kitted out hot shop. So, um, so what I've been actually trying to do is approach it in, I guess, a kindergarten sense of relearning how we explore the material and how we work with it. So I've been putting together a series of home glass hacks so that will be um, working with the material at home with either items that you can find from around the house or very kind of cheap um, tools that you can buy online. The first in the series that I've done is uh, glass bending with the tea light. So um, it's a great way to get the hands on the glass. And then I've been kind of, I guess, showing them the different applications of that, uh, which are huge. You know, they can be scaled up uh, eventually to neon working if they ever want to get into that, or even into kind of more illustrative uh, line drawing work. So. It's been really trying to approach it, I guess, in a fun, um, light-hearted way, but underpinning some, you know, key skills in, in, gla in glass bending and um, trying to maybe think outside the box. I find we're, we're really great, um, us glass blowers and glass makers, to adapt to our situations. I think that's one of the most difficult uh, things I've found about the, um, about the, the pandemic is that you know we're so resourceful and finding different ways of working and you know trying different things and experiencing you know great sort of discoveries through doing that and i think that uh, this has actually it, it, it's 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 very it's very difficult when you're when you're 
when you're you don't have that sort of um expanse of resource that you would normally mm -hmm. have to to draw on so it's even more of a challenge i mean i, I psychologically mm -hmm. i don't know how the students are even coping really thinking about doing their finals and you know also the whole effect of having having a show and that sort of emergence mm -hmm. that you have um mm -hmm. when you're actually doing your show it's such a big occasion in your life as an artist really isn't it it's you know it's a rite of passage i think that we all have when we go yeah. through art school and there's so much that's learned from putting up a show in itself you know painting walls and everything we've all we've all done it and put in those long hours in in coming up to the opening and the private views um and having all our friends and family there it's you know a momentous occasion so it's going to be difficult to perhaps maybe recreate that online i know some institutions are talking about doing an online show and how they can actually still create a special event for the artists themselves but for the friends and family and the sense of exclusivity as well for the potential collectors and um, that come to the kind of private view stage of it so i think different institutions are dealing with it in in different ways but it's of course an absolute pity that um, it's something that I suppose at the moment doesn't look like it's going to happen anyways this summer but perhaps there is maybe some potential then for shows later on in the year or even into next year instead. I'm just thinking as well that the um, you know the whole opportunity of bringing a show online and then actually looking at a whole pan-European um, mm. sort of collection of, of artists who are who are graduating at the same time you might end up widening your audience as opposed to having that very small select group of audience that you would have at your show with your friends and family, as you say yourself. It can really develop the way that we talk about our work and force us to, I guess, re-understand how to contextualise it to an audience that has never seen it before um, and an audience that has no, no knowledge of you or your previous work. So I think there can be, you know, some benefit in actually taking it from a very local audience and then suddenly it's on an international platform. So I suppose, you know, looking at it very pragmatically is that, well, actually, when we make our glass, we're, we're you know, burning a lot of fossil fuels. It's not perhaps the most sustainable or it's very hard to make the argument for it to be a sustainable making method. However, if we say our... I suppose maybe marketing what we've already made in in you know a thorough way and we're actually taking a lot of the making um and fleshing it out in a digital sense then i suppose it's rebalancing maybe the um the energy that's put into making it hmm. i suppose it, it offers um different kinds of storytelling as well through you know through engagement on online one of the things i find quite hard when i'm looking at pieces online is understanding scale um mm -hmm. you know how how to describe scale if you're just showing the object and not you know not in relation to anything else uh, you know are, yeah. are you are you um are you i know you're very fluent with the whole computer uh, and <laughs> things are you are you um talking to other other technicians around the world or are you comparing notes and how to yeah. how to approach it or how are you are you working you know from your own knowledge base at the moment um there's a great resource that myself and the other tech staff from uca have been involved with the last few weeks where it uh, brings together uh, technical staff from around europe and uh, further afield to discuss things like the the graduate shows that we would have been hosting and what are the potential um I guess solutions for for it now. So there's been really great ideas being thrown out from from different institutions about how to go about it. And um, funny enough, actually, scale hasn't really been mentioned in it yet. But it's a very very good point, Roisin. Um, mm -hmm. I find with my work, I always have to um, promoting it online. There always has to be a few images or even videos of it actually in hands. And you know, within the context of the human and the and the audience, and that actually, I think, even though it's digital and it's out of reach, somehow brings it a little bit closer. I'm also thinking about people working in in installation-based work. You know, mm. how how you know you're installing it in your bedroom and then trying to film it. It's it's mm. a minefield, really, isn't it? It's it's uh, yeah. 
a big thing, really. But the exciting thing about that is that it opens up opportunities for uh, VR um, approaches to actually yeah. experiencing yeah. work, which I think um, a lot of the big galleries have started to to explore in their online co collections. So you never know, it could be a push in a direction that we may not have taken before this. Yeah, and are you, are you engaging with the students on, on your CAD, uh, CAD as well then, or is that part of their learning, or is that part of the technical yeah. element? Here, um, last semester, I believe they acquired two ceramic 3D printers. So I'm within the Department of Glass and Ceramics and Craft, and we also have uh, regular 3D printers for PLA printing. So that's um, something that I incorporate quite a bit into my work, as you know. Um, I use 3D printed forms um, a lot in my uh, drinkware range to design them 3D printed and then take blowing moulds from. So it's, it also makes actually the whole, I guess, designing process a lot more efficient. Um, so that's something that I'd really now in my new role like to instill in students is that there's a lot of potential uh, for design work that can be done firstly on, on a computer and then 3D printed and you can have a very good prototype to look at and engage with before you even get into I guess the gas guzzling stage of the production which is the hot shop. And when you so you end up with a with a resin um, prototype of say your whiskey glasses so you end up with a resin prototype and then what are you making the blowing molds out of? So the uh, recipe that I got for this blow mould um, was when I did a stint in Estonia. Um, they had a great, yeah, great uh, blow mould recipe that used just regular sawdust um, from the woodwork shop. So usually kind of hardwood wood sawdust, not um, MDF, you know, nothing with glue in it. Um, so pure wood sawdust and, would you believe it or not, uh, toilet paper, which you let um, turn into a pulp. So the sawdust and the toilet paper mixed with, I've even used just regular builder's grade plaster. So nothing too expensive, nothing too hard to acquire. And um, those molds for me, I've had last up to 40 units. So wow. they're very, very handy to make. Yeah, yeah, hu huge compared to, I guess, maybe plaster blow molds that I, I had been making previously. So that was just a little, you know, tip that I picked up when, when I was over in Estonia. And um, it's something that actually I hope to bring into the department here as well. But it, they take a great, great cast of the uh, 3D printed resin. And the resin itself, um, I've got a few that I printed out uh, for my whiskey tumblers, some decanters, and um, some cocktail glasses as well. And they haven't had any damage at all. So what's really great about it is when the plaster mold has had its day, it can be um, disposed of correctly. And then I can take my little lightweight 3D prints and pop them in my suitcase and they come with me around the world. So Fantastic. for the kind of lit, yeah, little amount of uh, resin that's used in them, uh, they, la they last a lifetime. And it'll be something like that I can keep taking molds of wherever I go, unlike, say, heavy steel moulds that would be much harder to bring with me around the world. So it definitely suits my practice to be able to actually 3D print these objects and then take low moulds from them. They have soft edges on them, so you're not actually turning the glass in it, you're just holding the glass in it when you're actually blowing it. Um, there's no friction yeah. involved, it's just a, a two-part mould that you're dealing with. Well, in the whiskey tumblers, which are a, a square base that twists up into a circular top, they are a still mould. Uh, yeah, so there is no friction there. It goes in, blows, then we open it and come out. However, I have used uh, this recipe for turn moulds um, and it's worked really, really well. I've made some um, what I call tumbling tumblers. So um, as, you can, as you can imagine, they're tumblers that have a uh, rounded bottom on them um, and I was even able to like calculate the angle um, of the tumble so that uh, whatever was in it, your whiskey or your wine wouldn't slip out but they were made in a, a two-part turn mould and they worked well as well. Oh wow and you don't have to dry these moulds or you're, it's just a regular plaster mm -hmm. drying um, that are, are with the toilet paper obviously which is wet 
Those yeah. are, are you baking it? Or? Oh, uh, it's been trial and error for a few years and I've kept in contact with the studio that I worked with in Estonia. And uh, we've been kind of back and forth saying, how are you getting on with this? What are you trying new? And what we've come to at the moment is you dry it out completely for about a week. So it is dry. You've kind of got that um, a kind of bone dry feel to it. And the day of the blowing, you submerge it in water in the morning for about 10 minutes. And that's when the sawdust and the toilet paper pulp can absorb the water, which, of course, then stops it from cracking when it's being blown into. And then when you're done for the day, you dry it out again. And what we use actually with it is the um, electrician's graphite spray, mm. which I'm, I'm sure yeah, you've used. It's, a, it's brilliant. We used to use um, sugar water or Coca-Cola, but that can be a bit messy. <laughs> so yeah. it smells great, but it uh, can be a bit messy. Yeah. So um, this, this graphite spray has a beautiful surface uh, finish on it. So with these moulds, any sort of deterioration on the surface, we could put sand back with a bit of sandpaper and respray it. And yeah, they last up to 40 units. That's amazing. That's a great find. Mm. Um, I'm dying to ask about Absolutely. Estonia. I'd forgotten that you had been there. Tell me, tell, tell me why, why, did, why did you go to Estonia again? I can't remember how you even got there. Yeah, well, it's a fairly, I guess, a fairly odd story. I had just finished up uh, my studies in the National College of Art and Design in Dublin. And um, I did a stint over in New York that summer over in the Corning Museum of Glass. Um, and then it was kind of right, where am I going to next? And at that point in my life, I had met a blacksmith who was absolutely dying to go to Estonia. So um, I kind of followed my heart with that and um, planned to go over for a few months. But I think like with a lot of people working in our profession, we never just go on holidays or we never just go traveling. We always start seeking out studios and different glass blowers and glass makers to get involved with. So I uh, managed to get some Erasmus Plus funding, which funds internships. Um, and That's a I European wide scheme for uh, yes. of, uh, graduates, isn't it? Yes, indeed. So you've got Erasmus, which covers um, study abroad when you're within your degree, and then Erasmus Plus supports uh, students who want to um, do an internship in an EU country. Um, so it very much focuses on culture exchange as well as, I guess, developing the workplace skills. So um, I really, uh, you know, when, when that opportunity came up, I definitely kind of said, look, I'd love to even try and learn the language while I'm there and everything. And believe it or not, when I was out there, I had to teach glass blowing in Estonian. So it reminds so, me of me, um, me in Japan teaching Japanese students. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> glass, blowing, glass blowing in Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> oh god well we all we have to know is the important things like blow and stop is i guess the two most important <laughs> yeah yeah so it was it was definitely kind of throw, thrown into it but it was absolutely wonderful really really great studio a really great great glass floor there um you know estonia in itself had never you know come up i guess you know to my knowledge before that of um you know of any kind of place to go or any particularly massive glass history but funnily enough when I was there you know I was hearing all about the um, Soviet glass factories that used to exist there oh, and yeah. learn a bit about that that background mm. as well. Mm. A lot of heavy cutting and um, yeah big but very large pieces as well a lot of architectural glass mm. So let's go let's talk about um, uh, your most recent fabulousness um, was at Collect and maybe just talk a little bit about um, how you evolve your ideas and what your work is actually about, your own work is about that you mm. um, showed at Collect that well, for people who don't know, maybe our international um, viewers, Collect is an extraordinary um, exhibition that is of many different craft practices um, that is held in the UK. It used to be held in the Saatchi Gallery. I exhibited there myself yeah. at one point. Um, mm. Beautiful, beautiful gallery. And um, this year moved to Somerset House, which is a period, beautiful, beautiful period house mm. with beautiful grounds. Um, mm. And it's a selection, um, a selection represented by different galleries. 
um, that show different artists. And then there are also national um, craft councils who also represent. And there's also an open exhibition that you can go and um, apply to uh, to exhibit freely if you're accepted. That's curated and, and it's very beautiful and it's really well attended. I mean, I don't know what the figures were. Mm -hmm. It seems like vast this year. Um, queues of people waiting to go in and huge sales from it as well. Yeah. It seemed that a lot of major museums and galleries were there um, buying, which was mm -hmm. a fantastic thing. But you went Absolutely. with Northlands. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so tell us the story yeah. about it. I'd love to hear how that, ha how that happened. Yeah, you're correct. Um, Northlands Creative were the uh, group that brought me to collect they're um, a school and they're based up in the very, 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 very tip of Scotland. Um, it's almost 30 miles south of John O'Groats. It's, it's one of the most remote places that you can that you can go to make glass. So they are a not 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 for profit um, group that support glass making, and that's through master classes and residencies. So we had a few months ago in Ireland. Before Christmas we had the Ireland Glass Biennale which was an amazing event um, organised by Dr Caroline Madden and Caroline had asked me would I consider talking as an emerging maker at the symposium that was on in conjunction with the opening of the Biennale so of course I said like absolutely and um, so uh, I was talking I was one of the last speakers on the last day and um, even me myself I was all tired out from, from the few days of activities but um, I talked about my own work and at that point I was really focusing on I guess maybe questioning the sustainability of glass making and you know whether we can make right with the fact that we still we still make glass and what's it, what is its purpose so during this talk I had the director of Northlands in the audience um, listening and I have to admit I was maybe quite quite naive. I, I didn't actually um, recognise them, but uh, Karen Phillips, who's the director, she came up to me afterwards and said, come and talk to me at the end of today. So I said, all right, no problem. Um, so I came up to her at the end, I was like, so how's it going? Did you enjoy the talk? Um, and she just said, look, we're from Northlands and we'd love to take your work to collect. So uh, that's kind of how, how it just happened. Um, you know and it's it's very it's very unusual i think within our profession to get something that you haven't wrote pages and pages and pages on and made several applications for funding for and you know it's very rare for um i guess a body to just come up and say yeah we you know we believe in you and we want we well want they're to so to the next they're so progressive and they're so open mm. and they're so supportive i mean i think it's an extraordinary um organization it's just really you know beautifully beautifully led and uh, you know everything i mm. see them getting involved in they're just you know they're just so passionate about what they do as well mm. and i think it's an extraordinary mm. thing to you know to reach across borders which they seem to be doing um yeah. to invite people you know from different places to to get involved in that project i would love to have something like that in ireland i really would um yeah so what did you bring did you make brand new work mm. for that or did you did you use work that you had shown well you just you had only just graduated anyway from yeah there. yeah so luckily enough i had a fairly good body of work that I produced out of my master's program in Plymouth College of Art. I finished that last September. Um, With and flying colours. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> thank, thankfully. You got an amazing <laughs> big prize, study, I, I think, remember. For a little bit. What was the Yeah, all, it was, um, so at the opening of our show, the, so the, they give out a few kind of awards, but the top award that's um, in 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 the college itself is chosen by the principal. And actually, our principal used to be a designer at Dartington Crystal, so he very much you know has a background in glass and appreciates it. But he can choose from the whole master's cohort. Um, I guess the work that most you know stands out to him, um, and actually uh, he he said. Uh, last year was the only year he ever chose two people and it was actually myself and one of my best best friends from the course who um, was in illustration so 
it was you know really really fabulous and you know I, I just couldn't believe the success that I had from that you know it was picked up then afterwards by um organizations like Arts Thread who helped fund me to show at Handmade Chelsea just before Christmas um which is um held by Handmade in Britain so that was an amazing opportunity I got to go to new designers in London um which is a brilliant platform just to get spotted and in that I was then spotted by the Crafts Council who uh, then had me in Crafts Magazine afterwards so it was one of these um, situations where just weeks after weeks I was hearing people come back to me you know people that I didn't even realize I'd spoken to at these events and they said well I'm actually such and such and you know they'd come come to me with diff, different opportunities so it was a it was a whirlwind absolute whirlwind well congratulations yeah. you obviously deserved it Thank so you. it's just i mean i've been watching you online and it's uh, you know it's one thing after another as you say you know it's really, <laughs> really fantastic now i interrupted you about what you were what you brought with you to oh yeah <laughs> Well, this is it. It's a it's a whirlwind um, in terms of my work, but it's a whirlwind in terms of, in terms of my uh, line of thought as well. I'm always kind of on to the next thing, but yeah. The so the work that um, I had gotten together for my masters, and that was what I shown then in Dublin um, at the symposium that was on, uh, was really focused on actually wearable glass. Uh, so it's taking it out, I guess, of maybe the context of beadwork and that, and drawing on that that tactile quality that you have with it but um i guess elaborating on what what it, what it can be and what it can look like so for me i had started this i guess line of wearable work in my undergraduate degree um and you know quite amazed that actually that line of questioning has gone on for five years after it but I was really interested in looking at how do you combine glass with other materials. Um, particularly, I started to tend towards materials such as recycled rubber. Um, so I actually, for my work, I reclaim a lot of rubber from um, old bikes, bike tires, inner tubes, um, and I guess um, redesign it, I cut it up, um, combine it with my glass to make these bigger wearable structures. But what the combination of materials does is it allows the glass to become far more durable and even flexible. So the body of work that I had um, presented at my master's degree show uh, combined handmade glass. I use lamp working primarily for my glass making. So uh, for, I guess, the, the listeners who may not be maybe familiar with lamp working, it's um, uh, glass melting with a very very small flame but the applications of it are absolutely huge it's working on a smaller scale but you can definitely make a lot of individual components that can combine together to make quite large structures so for for these pieces um, they sat in these rubber structures which um, I got water jet cut and laser laser cut so it was really relying on the computer aided design um, element and uh, I suppose the certainty that came with that, that and the cutting patterns and I also was 3D printing flexible resin uh, frameworks for the glass to sit into as well so in the end the objects were made up of these I guess uniquely handmade glass components that sat within you know very I guess um, objects that were made hugely in like the kind of manufacturing of certainty which is you know 3d printing and laser laser cutting amazing i don't know if you've ever heard of the um of the fashion designer um she's a british fashion designer who lives in the south of france her name is beverly smart she's very active online as well and she designs um using uh inner tube rubber a lot of very beautiful oh. uh, different kinds of components no glass but she gets them made yeah. in africa um working in a in a in a community project um in a sustainable way uh mm. to both employ people and then to make the products using recycled materials from from africa um and sustainability is a big is a big thing for you as well mm. though isn't it it's one of the things that you mm. your your fulcrum really for for designing mm. do you do you start when you're starting to design do you start from a drawing then or are you working very closely with the material i can't i can't do anything yeah. without 
without starting with a drawing. I, you know, I, I, yeah. I make millions of drawings before I actually, you know, get going on something really. Um, you know, and it very much is a material led practice, but that kind of conversation with the material is back and forth between working with it in the hot shop or working with it on the lamp working and then in my sketchbooks and going back and forth and back and forth. So as you know yourself, with any kind of finished item that you bring to exhibition, there's been so many iterations of it probably along the way where you make it and take it out the next day out of the kiln, do some cold work and you say, look, that's not quite right. You go back to the drawing board. So it's very much a back and forth. Um, and absolutely, yeah, the kind of sustainability of our practice plays hugely on, on my conscience. Um, you know, it's very, very hard to make that argument that glass is a sustainable making method if you look purely at the few minutes of gas burning that it takes to make the object. So for my practice the last few years, I've really been focusing on the whole life cycle of the object itself. And in uh, Plymouth, in, in Plymouth College of Art, they've got a brilliant um, product design um, uh, school of thought with, within the college and really, really great minds to, to have, a, have a nat or two about it. But what I started to, um, I suppose, flesh out in my work the last two years was looking at the whole life cycle. So that's where, um, as you saw online, where I started to engage my audience and the potential end users in the object before it was even made. So that the, the actual blowing itself was only, was only a, a very small section of building up that life cycle of the object. Just one thing yeah. that you were saying there, you know, where you, you have mm -hmm. the luxury of going backwards and forwards, you know, and testing things mm -hmm. and not testing, you know, and trying different stuff mm -hmm. while you're in college and while you have the facilities that you're working in. When, when, um, when you're working, like I do, renting studios, that privilege is not there anymore where you can really, you know, be going backwards and forwards. You go in, you make, you, you come out again. That sort of testing ground um, is not as as um, available as it used to be um you know when i when i had a facility that i could work in permanently so yeah it's a very different kind of experience for me now certainly making work you know in that context but you're i, I loved we were talking a while ago i remember and you were talking about the the whole concept behind your pieces where you can actually um you know this idea even of wearable art i mean loads of people are scared of wearing glass you know um, yeah. and that you're kind of taunting people to to touch yeah. it and to get involved you know when you're when you're having it in the gallery sense you're asking people to touch the glass and all that sort of stuff but also one of the things i thought was really interesting that you had this um idea around um that the whole fragility of the piece helped its longevity it's kind of a it's a cur curious duality isn't it that we work with with the fragility of our material um you know it's De definitely something that I, I've tried to play on because sure I want people to be confident enough to actually take take my glass and wear it and really love it and not not be scared to actually wear it out you know I often say one of the greatest pities is granny's dresser with glass gathering dust yeah um you know I think if, if glass is going to be made it should be used you know and that's yeah. that's one of the best ways that we can really I guess show our appreciation for the amount of energy that it takes to make it is to actually just use it and love it. But uh, there is actually something to be said for still recognizing the fragility of the material because what comes with that, I guess, is an element of care. You know, it's yeah. taking, I guess, the extra caution to look after these these beautiful glass objects. I think also if you you know wearing your glass must make you move in a slightly different way as well. So the yeah. elegance or the you know the sort of the caring of it while you're actually wearing wearing it could also influence how you move yourself. I've always I remember having a conversation with the journalist uh, Christine Lin, uh, Leach about um, she about it was a lace exhibition that we were preparing for down uh, down in Kilkenny and she was mm. talking about this beautiful crocheted lace tablecloth that she has at home that she never has never ever used I keep meaning to send her a little note now and saying now you have the time you can take it out and I was saying like if you yeah. put that lace tablecloth on the table it would make you take your tea 
you know, for that occasion yeah. in a totally different way. And likewise, Absolutely. if you have your granny's, you know, your granny's crystal in the cupboard that you actually, if you put it on the table and you had it for dinner, yeah. you know, even with your family, it would make you mm -hmm. drink your wine in a totally different way, you know, and likewise, Absolutely. you know, I, I, you know, to yeah. wear your jewelry must feel quite extraordinary. Um, you know, when you're, when, even the sound of it, I'm sure is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. We're so lucky to work with a material that's as tactile as glass is. You know, it's something that it, it has, again, that duality of touch me, but don't touch me. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's such a beautiful quality to work with that you just wouldn't get with, you know, other materials. And this, this often is um, something that comes up. I've spoken at a few conferences about why you should handmade glass even still exist if we can produce objects say in plastic that look the same but at the end of the day they're just not the same they're not they're not handmade glass and they don't have the the character of handmade glass and you know we we definitely treat handmade glass differently well i was in a factory um in the south of france there um this this last year last year um mm where a very very famous factory in Bios, which is very famous mm. for a bubbly kind of glass that they used to make in the 1970s and um it's a huge factory production um of very normal kind of bowls and glasses and all that sort of all different colors and but right beside their glass is an absolute replica in plastic and oh selling, really yeah they're selling them side by side and, you know, people come home, you know, I bought you something from the earth and it's a plastic salad yeah. bowl. And it's so, it's, and it's, 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 it's so bizarre to me, you know, that why, you know, why, why would you want the plastic one instead of the glass one? It's right there. And they're going, well, you know, we will have it for picnics or, you know, use it in the summertime. And yeah. It's open and you go, oh God. <laughs> but like they, I don't know, they, it seems to be working for them. I think it's quite horrific myself, but yeah, it seems to be working for them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, however, if you commission a set of bespoke, you know, four whiskey glasses and you take them out at the end of a long day or you take them out for anniversaries or birthdays or whatever, and it becomes tied up with, um, you know, huge emotional durability, um, it actually means that that object la can last centuries you know it can it can be heirloom down to generations i think, so it's, I think it's also it also has to do with the slowness of of life mm. as well you know where you take the time to yeah. wash and dry yeah. and you know in a mad world where people are throwing things into a dishwasher and you know i remember waterford trying yeah. to uh, waterford crystal trying to um get to a stage where they could actually have this water dishwasher proof um, crystal and they arrived at doing it you know very well um, my mother yeah. always says you know the best conversations are had over the washing up you know you know you look at the kind of hipster culture of sourdough making and uh, even like making your own craft beer at home there's you know there's absolutely still an interest in slowness and in really I guess appreciating the object that you're using whether whether you're whether it's food that you're consuming or beer that you're drinking, or the glass that the beer is in, that it's handmade, and you're taking the time to put the beer that you've made in a handmade glass. You know, there's absolutely an audience for that, and you know, I think that's even reflected with um, you see in a lot of um, food and beverage establishments now that are very much going towards the craft side of the market, and they often handmade lighting in them. They've often handmade neon signs in them. Uh, so there's, you know, absolutely, I think, a huge, a huge need. And I'd say, you know, particularly now for slowness and for really appreciating and curating every part of your experience, even if that's sitting down with, you know, a glass of wine in yeah. handmade crystal. I think we're going to I think we're going to see huge changes after this, really, you know, of how people live mm -hmm. and, you know, what they're consuming as well. You know, this, you know, how they consume things and what they're consuming. Um, in material mm. material culture i think is going to go through an, a really interesting phase so listen we've Absolutely. been talking for ages um yeah <laughs> uh i think we better cut it off there now although we could we could keep going of course and it's always gorgeous Absolutely, it's yeah. always lovely lovely to catch up 
Um, yeah, no, thank you very much for having me on. I hope, I hope the next few weeks go really well for you. Um, I'm, mm. I'm fascinated to see what's happening with your online teaching. I mean, it's quite a head wreck, yeah. I think, even thinking about it, you know, with the amount of experience of teaching, <laughs> I'd, have to, I'd have to really dig deep now. I'm sure I could come up with lots of different stuff, but it, it's, I'm sure it's yeah. a huge challenge for you. So listen, we're going to meet him and uh, good night in Boherlath and, and we'll catch up with you the next time you're home in Ireland. Yeah, great, great, meet him all. That's long before. Long before.